I'm going to read Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9 this morning. And then I'll pray, and we will stand together. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you made a way for us to be saved, to be rescued, to be be freed from our sin, to be freed from Satan's sin and death. Jesus, you did that on that mountain, on Calvary, 2,000 years ago as you died on the cross and rose from the grave in our place. Lord, I pray that this gathering here would be a proclamation to the world, to the forces of darkness that you have won, that you have conquered, that yours is the victory. I pray that we would proclaim to one another as we sing together, as we pray together, as we study your word together, that you are the victor, Jesus. Remind us of the beauty of the gospel as we continue through Genesis 3 today. Help us to see the beauty and the simplicity of your grace that you've given us on the cross and in your resurrection. So King Jesus, open up our eyes that we would see you and love you more. God, I pray that we would leave this place loving you more than when we came in. I pray that this gathering would be all about you and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to pray together. Uh, one thing, Hebrews 13.3 tells us to remember those that are in prison and being mistreated. And I think of that when I think of Afghanistan. Uh, And there's a lot of other countries, too, but Afghanistan is kind of front and center right now. So we need to think about those pastors and those Christians in Afghanistan. Um, So let's, let's pray. Thank you, holy, sovereign God, for for how great you are, for making a way for us to be made right with you through the death of Christ on the cross and paying for our sins. For those of us that believe and trust that that is the only way. We think of Afghanistan this morning, the immense pressure that people are under right now, especially Christians. Uh, We just pray that they can make it out of there. If that's your will for them, Lord, that they'll, they'll make it out of there and be safe. Uh, But we know you're sovereign, and you can work all things to good. We think of Haiti and the the recent earthquake and the thousands that died in that earthquake and the the struggle to recover. We pray for those efforts and those people uh, helping with that. Pray for Samaritan's Purse as they set up that field hospital. And we just pray the gospel would be shared. Uh, There are other natural events going on. We've got a tropical storm coming up through and flooding in Tennessee. Just think of all those impacted. And that you'd be glorified through it all. And then more locally, uh, we just think of those within the body that have health issues. And we just pray that as a body of believers that we would do what we know we need to do to help. Help brothers and sisters with those struggles and support them however we can. And we just thank you for this time this morning and 
uh, pray that you'll work through Pastor Zach and that hearts will be open and attentive and that we'll, be, we'll apply what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. For the rest of us, big kids, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is where we will be this morning as we continue our series, Beginning Brokenness and Blessing, and I think it's a a timely series for us as we look at the beginning of all things, right, the beginning of brokenness. We've already, uh, we already began talking about that that last week as we began uh, the first part of Genesis chapter 3, and and then we'll see uh, this week the blessing of Christ even in that brokenness. And of course, we'll continue to see that over and over and over again in Genesis. One of, one of the things we believe here as a church is that all of Scripture is pointing to Jesus. Uh, so it's not as if the Bible is this series of disconnected stories. I think sometimes we can have a, a false view that, uh, well, the Old Testament was about one thing, and the, the prophets in the Old Testament were talking about one thing, and, and the stories in the Old Testament were talking about a, a different thing, and the Psalms are kind of for today, but, but the rest of the Old Testament we can kind of throw away, and the New Testament's the only thing that's important, and that's, that's not true at all. That's, that could be, couldn't be further from the truth, right? We believe all of Scripture is pointing us to Jesus. We see that time and time again. We see Paul tell Timothy to preach the Word. Well, what's the Word he's talking about? They didn't have the New Testament back then. Right? That was just the Old Testament, and it's all pointing us to Christ. Luke 24, you guys have probably heard me say this a dozen times. You'll, you'll get sick of it eventually, but, but I think it's important to remind ourselves. Jesus, on the road to Emmaus with his two disciples, it says that he went to the law and the prophets and showed them all the things revealing himself or concerning himself, Right? how it's all pointing us to him. And, and I think we're going to see one of the, the clearest places in all of the Old Testament here this morning uh, as we look at Genesis Chapter 3, again, all of Scripture is pointing to him, but this one is just clear, this foreshadowing or, or typology, what we would call typology. In other words, there are types of Christs in the Old Testament that are pointing us to the one Christ, the one Messiah, Jesus. And this is where we're going to go today. So let's pray together. Father, again, as we open up your word, as we look at Genesis chapter 3, these words written thousands of years ago, and yet, Lord, are so relevant for us today. And they are alive. And God, they can penetrate our hearts. I pray that you would penetrate our hearts like only you can. Those who are believers, those who have followed you, continue to penetrate us and remind us of the beauty of the gospel so that we would have a firm confidence in you and nothing else. And for those in here or or listening online who are not followers of you, who have not confessed you, Jesus, as Lord, who have not trusted in your death and resurrection, Lord, I pray that you would remove the blinders off their hearts, help them to see the beauty of the gospel, draw them to yourself, Holy Spirit, like only you can. Help us to see the beauty of this ancient text, these ancient words. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we, as we talked about last week, Genesis chapter 3, we're splitting this into three different weeks. It begins to tell us how evil has invaded God's good design. These first three chapters of Genesis are, are of, of great, extreme importance. We have to get these right. right. Genesis 1 and 2 establish God's dominance, God's sovereignty, God's rule and reign over all creation, right? We're talking about the entire universe, and then, of course, it kind of... Uh, zeroes in or zooms in on the world and then even in there zooms in on uh, humanity and God institutes certain things like uh, how valuable man is, right? We talked about the image of God, the imago Dei and that mankind has great value because they've been in the created in the Imago Day. We've talked about the institution of marriage and how God gets to define what marriage is and, and the importance of that. But now, as we get to Genesis chapter 3, we begin to see how those things begin to break down. Evil has invaded God's good design. The serpent, Satan, has invaded the garden. And this is the great, as we talked about last week, the great cosmic battle of the Bible. 
good versus evil, light versus dark, sight versus blindness. That's not just Genesis chapter 3. That's the entirety of Scripture, the entirety of history. That's what's going on even today. We talked a little bit about that. Like What's going on in Afghanistan or anywhere else in the world isn't just what we see on the news, isn't just what's reported. There are uh, deeper, more spiritual battles going on there. We have to recognize that. We have to look at this world as followers of Christ through the lens of Scripture and see, see things for what they truly are, spiritual warfare, Satan, the serpent, still moving, still fighting, and yet defeated. We'll see that here today. Genesis to Revelation gives us a picture of Christ's glory and Satan's attempt to thwart it. The book of Isaiah tells us you and I were created for the glory of God. You and I are designed to make much of God, not much of ourselves. And hence why all of the Bible is ultimately pointing us to God. All of our sermons are ultimately pointing us to God. And we have to see his beauty through all of that. And that's, that's what we want to do here. We want to give you a big vision, a grand view of God. If, so if you're coming here just to feel better about yourselves, uh, I can assure you this message won't be it. And I can assure you that that church, <laughs> this church won't necessarily be that, because we don't want that. We don't want people who are leaving here feeling better about themselves, but leaving here more confident and feeling better about Christ. We want to be confident, people confident in who Jesus is. And then because of that, we can say, I have great value, not because of what I've done, but because of who Christ is and what he's done in my place. And we'll see that here today. And remember, Adam and, Adam and Eve's eyes have been opened to good and evil, and for the first time they felt shame. Let me read verse 7 again of, of Genesis chapter 3. This is where we ended last week. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Right? They, they pitifully try to cover up their nakedness, but it would not be enough to cover their shame. We'll cover that next week. We're going to see that as we get to the end of Genesis 3 and why that's important. Uh, but, but for now, we're going to zero in really on verses 8 through 19. So let's begin reading in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Let's stop there. For now, well, let's go through this, walk through this slowly. <clears throat> we see that it was this shame, that shame that, that we saw back in verse 7, the, the shame that caused Adam and Eve to cover up their nakedness, to realize they were in sin. They now knew what evil was. It, it's this very shame that caused Adam and Eve to immediately hide themselves when they hear God. Right? Look at that back in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. That, for the first time in history, happened. Every other time, when they had heard God walking, they would run to him and walk with him and be with him. And again, we don't have the timeline. We're not sure exactly how long they got to walk with him and know him and build this intimate relationship with God. Uh, but, but now sin has fractured that. Right? For the first time, rather than running to him, they ran away from him. And we're familiar with this, right? Like a child who knows he has done something wrong runs and hides from his parents. Right? When, when a child, when you come home and your child has done something wrong, or maybe, maybe you, and you can think back to your childhood, the first thing that you wanted to do usually was hide. That's our first instinct, right? To hide from our, our wrongness, to hide from our sin. We know we're in the wrong. And so that's what Adam and Eve do here. They run and try to hide themselves pitifully as if they can hide from God, right? The all-seeing, all-knowing God who created them as well as, as well as the rest of the universe. Can you imagine the sadness of this event for their whole lives? Again, their whole lives, Adam and Eve up to this point had unashamedly walked and talked with the God of the universe. Can you imagine that? None of us have been able to do that. One day we will, as followers of Jesus, but none of us really know. We can't 
even conceptualize what that would be like to walk and talk face to face with the God of the universe. And Adam and Eve got to do that. And now they ran away from him. This is the great cosmic sadness that begins in Genesis chapter 3. They hid from him in their guilt. Why is that? Why, why did they hide from him in their guilt? Why did he have to go up calling to them? That's verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Because we see throughout scripture, we've seen this, we can see this even in our own lives, the presence of God is actually a fearful thing to those who are in sin. Right? Because God is so holy and majestic, and it's hard to even begin to fathom and, and talk about it. We can't even fully grasp God. That those in sin immediately know uh, that, that they're not supposed to be there. Right? That they don't belong. That's why so often we battle with guilt and shame. If, if I can be honest, my wife and I were just talking about this this morning. That's one of the things I battle with constantly on a personal basis. I just want to be honest here is guilt. Guilt weighs over me constantly, and I'm sure many of you can, can uh, agree with that as well and sympathize with that. Guilt constantly weighs over us because we see how great and majestic and marvelous God is and holy, and he's set apart from us, and, the, and there's this great shame that comes over us. That's why Isaiah, when he sees God in a vision in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, his first words are not, Oh, man, look how great God is. You know, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right? Can you imagine what Isaiah saw? And he fell down in terror, in fear. We see that time and time again throughout Scripture. It's why those who have a bad view of grace are constantly in view that God, uh, in fear that God will strike them down. Right? I've, we've quoted A.W. Tozer here before. He says, the, the most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. And so, so when we begin to think that God is somehow just going to strike us down uh, because we're sinful beings, we will constantly be in fear. And that's a, that's a bad view of grace. That's a bad view of the cross. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. But, but for those in sin, God's presence is a fearful thing. I remember one of my students, the last church I served at, I was the student pastor there, and one of my students who uh, was there when I first came, he was a senior in high school uh, when I started, and, uh, and he was one of those kids that would kind of show up and, and sit in the back and was never real involved, didn't really come from a, a Christian home. His mom was a believer, but she wasn't real involved in his spiritual life, and um, he was one of those kids you tend to kind of just write off. Like, he's, he's just here for his senior year. He's not listening. He doesn't even really care uh, what I have to say. And we, we had a few conversations, but, but then he graduated high school, and he moved on. He went to the next thing. He got a job, and I, I thought I'd never hear from, from him again. Uh, well, then one day, this was just a couple years ago, he, he texts me out of the blue randomly. I uh, didn't even know anything, what, where he was or what was going on in his life. And he said, hey, Zach, can I meet with you? And I said, sure, sure, come into my office. And he was like immediately, like an hour after he texted me, came into my office. And so I knew something was up. And, and he said, so I had a dream. And he said, in my dream, this is amazing how God does this. He says, in my dream, I was driving from Hobbs to Lovington. This is southeastern New Mexico, as flat as can be uh, in this. So you can see a long ways. He says, in my dream, my mom and I are driving uh, from, from Lovington to Hobbs. And, and all of a sudden, the sky went dark, and then this flashing light came up, and I saw it get closer and closer, and then I could see it was God coming at me. And he said, and immediately I got out of the car, and I fell down in fear uh, in, in his dream. And he's like, and I knew he was going to send me to hell. I knew I was in sin. He said, it was so fearful. I was so afraid. And he's like, and I don't want to be afraid anymore. And I was like, man, you came, came to the right place. Right? And, and that day in my office, I mean, he gave his life to Jesus and, and recognized the beauty of grace that he doesn't have to be afraid of the presence of, of God. But it was so significant, God even using a dream in his life to show him right, our, our sin and our shame and how it separates us from God. Right? Because that's what the gospel does. It has to break us first so that we can see our depravity, to then show us how wonderful and beautiful and glorious it is that even in our brokenness and depravity, there's grace. And now uh, my student Sergio, right, two years later, following Jesus, has seen the beauty of the gospel. 
Uh, and now the presence of God no longer scares him, but rather is a, is a wonderful, glorious thing. Right? You see the, the grand shift there, and we'll see that here in a moment. Again, like a parent who knows right where his child is hiding, God obviously knew where Adam and Eve were, yet he gently calls them. Right? Can you, can you see the gentleness here? I know I didn't really read it in that tone, but I kind of see, and we can almost read in here, God's gentleness as he's walking through the garden. He, he already knows what Adam and Eve have done. He already knows where they are. Right? He's all-knowing. But verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And now Adam replies, And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Sin and the guilt it brings has pulled us away from the presence of God, right? You see how it already begins to do that? Remember what, what Satan said. Satan said, uh, you, when you eat of it, you will not surely die. And we talked about how that was a half-truth. Adam and Eve did not die right away. They would die Later on, Adam would leave to, live to be over 940 years old, right? This, this old man, he would live for a, a long time. And yet, already, sin has already put into, some, into place some of the deathly habits. In other words, separation from God and sin and brokenness. Like, look what it's done already. Already, it has separated Adam and God. Adam has run away. Adam's sin and shame has already begun to separate him from the Lord. And now, because of our sinful nature, that's passed down to us, by the way, because of our sinful nature, we are born into this same type of separation from the presence of God. If you, if you don't believe me, just go and read Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And if you were to stop there in the book of Romans, you would be feeling pretty horrible about yourself, right? And that's why Romans goes on and gives us the beauty of the gospel. But those first three chapters in Romans establish you and I are not born automatically as children of God or in the right with God. In fact, we are born separated from the presence of God because of our sin. It's what that sin and that brokenness has done. So our biggest problem... We have to get this. this. This, I think, really shifts the way that we live. Our biggest problem is not just that you and I are immoral beings who need to become a little more moral. Right? This is why I've quoted that, that quote to you before. Russell Moore says this in, in one of his books. He says uh, that, that um, Mayberry leads to hell just as surely as Sodom does. Right? Because morality doesn't save. Mayberry for the younger generation, I know I'm the younger generation as well, but uh, from the show, the Andy Griffith show, right? looks like this town that's perfect and has everything together, and yet without Christ, that morality leads to hell just as surely as Sodom and Gomorrah do. And that's the problem. You and I, our biggest problem is not that we are immoral beings who need to just become more moral. That's not what the gospel's about. The, our biggest problem is that you and I are dead, separated from God, separated by sin, and we need to be made right with God. The bad thing is, dead people can't make themselves alive. We cannot make ourselves right with God. We cannot bridge that gap. Someone has to in our place. We are separated from the one we are meant to enjoy and be with forever. As sin separated Adam and Eve from the one they were meant to be with and to enjoy forever. And sin has already begun to do that. And look at God's response in verse 11. Again, I I, I, think, I don't think this is a harsh tone. I think God is heartbroken over these things. Look what he says in verse 11. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? All right, it's not a joy when a child disobeys his parents. If the parents have joy over that, there's something wrong with them, right? It's heartbreaking. It's heart-wrenching. You can almost hear that in God's voice here as he says this, because God knew the pain and the heartache and the destruction that disobedience to him would bring. And look what it has brought. I mean, it just takes five minutes watching the news, and we see pain and brokenness and heartache everywhere. That's what sin has brought into this world. It's been going on for thousands of years. God knew that that was the result of eating the fruit. Again, we talked about that. Eating a fruit, really? And it's spiraled down into all of this brokenness and disaster and destruction and murder and rape and all the horrible things that go on in the world. God knew that, that that would happen when they disobeyed him. And so no wonder so many people are so broken, unfulfilled, and fearful. No wonder anxiety is at an all-time high. Drugs are at an all-time high. Counseling is at an all-time high. 
as things begin to spiral more and more seemingly out of control and sin breaks what God made right and what God called good. That's how sick and gross sin is. So how do we respond, Christian? How do we respond when someone comes to us with this kind of fear and brokenness? Our, our response, Christian, cannot be separation and shunning. For too long, many different sects of the church, S-E-C-T-S of the church, have kind of shunned off the rest of the world. When the world has come to the church with brokenness, we've kind of stiff-armed them and said, nope, you're staying at a distance. We're going to separate ourselves in a white steepled building and you guys stay over there. No wonder our nation does not trust the church anymore. Christian, we have a God-given duty to go out and to show people the one thing that fixes that brokenness. To make much of Christ. We don't hold sinners at bay with a stiff arm. We welcome them in as Jesus does and said, look to Christ. Take on his burden upon you because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. Look to Jesus. Because when we do that, when we hold a stiff arm, one, that gives us that shows we have a bad view of grace, and that shows we have a bad view of our own sinful nature. Because it's not as if the church is kind of separated off and we're these holier-than-thou people and the rest of the world is broken. I mean, Romans chapter 1. Flip over with me quickly to Romans chapter 1. Let me just read off this list of sins to make us feel real good about ourselves. Romans chapter 1, which we often go to to point out the wrongness of, of homosexuality and and, and rightfully so, right? We talked about marriage just a couple of weeks ago because verse 26 begins like this. For this reason, for the reason that they rejected God and created other idols, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And we kind of like to stop there and say, see, look at the, the brokenness of homosexuality and the brokenness of, of broken marriages all around. And, and for sure, the Bible points to that. But look what it continues on. This is where it brings us all in. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. This is all of us, by the way. This is every single person who's been separated from God. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy Really? Envy? Have you ever wanted something that wasn't yours? Have you ever been jealous of someone who had a position that you wanted to be in? And God's comparing that with malice and homosexuality and evil? That makes us all guilty. Murder? You say, ah, I got that one. Until Jesus redefines murder. It says if you've had hatred in your heart towards someone else, whether that's your next door neighbor or the Taliban, it's the same as if you've murdered them. That brings us all in. Strife? Just go to, come to one of my family meetings, one of my family get-togethers if you don't believe strife exists, and you'll see. Deceit. How many of us just have lied to someone and tried to deceive them? Maliciousness. They are gossips. Uh-oh. How many of us like to get together and talk? Did you see what this person did? Slanderers. Haters of God. Insolent. Haughty. Boastful. Right? How many of us say, look at me. Look what I've done. Look at my righteousness. That's the Pharisees were doing. Right? They thought they were good and they were so haughty and boastful. Inventors of evil. Disobedient to parents. There's another one we're all guilty of. Foolish. How many of us are foolish? Don't walk in wisdom. Faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So church, lest we're tempted to say, look at those people out there. The Bible faces us. The, the law faces us, gives us this mirror. It says, no, look at your brokenness. Look at your sin. This is every single one of us. Broken, sinful beings, and that separates us from God. But thank God that the Bible doesn't stop there, right? We'll continue on uh, in seeing the beauty of the gospel. Verse 13, verses 12 and 13. The man said, 
The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So we're going to, we see the blame game. So before we continue on with uh, some of the consequences of sin, I think a question we have to ask, and some, some people may be asking this, many people ask this question, is does the consequence fit the crime? Or the punishment fit the crime, right? We've, we've asked that question many times before. Did, did eating a fruit really deserve separation from God, right? Because what's at the heart of that? And we looked at that a little bit last week. The heart of that is ultimately disobedience to God. And we're not just talking about the physical consequences, right? God's going to give us a list of some of the physical, earthly consequences that sin has brought into the world. But we're also talking about death. Physical death and physical separation from God. And that's the second death, right, for those who are not in Christ. Eternal death in hell, separated from God. And so we have, we have to answer that question, I think, a couple of ways. Firstly, we have to say that because you and I are not the ultimate judges of what is right and wrong, we cannot be the ultimate judges of the consequences for right and wrong, right? We, we establish that. That goes all the way back. Anytime we talk about this, we have to go back to the beginning all the way back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he gets to define what the line is. Remember we talked about that line last week. Eve went above the line by adding to God's law. That's legalism. And so often we go below the line, right? That's theological liberalism, right? Anytime we, we veer off the line that God has given us, we are essentially making ourselves the definers of truth. Ourselves the definers of right and wrong. And we don't get to do that. Only God does. So you and I also do not get to be the judges and say this is a right consequence for this sin and this isn't a right consequence for this sin. But secondly, we also have to understand that what is so horrific and horrible about sin. The atrocity of sin is not so much about the act committed. And you may say, well, what about some of the horrific acts committed that are going on in Afghanistan, a rape or murder, right? And there are horrible, horrible things that go on. But this is what makes sin so horrific, whether we're talking about rape and murder or deceit and gossip, right? They're all horrific sins, not so much about the act committed, but about the one that the act is committed against, right? So let's use an illustration here. If I were to do this kicking motion, I'll come out here. If I were to do this kicking motion and kick over this fan, that would be kind of weird, right? You guys would think, okay, I, I kicked this fan. I'm just doing this motion here, and I kicked the fan over. You guys would say, okay, that, that probably wasn't really nice. Zach, you shouldn't have done that. So a little scolding. No, don't do that again. What if I were to kick this pulpit over, right? Still doing the same motion as I, as I kick the fan. What if I were to kick this pulpit over? That might be a little more serious. You guys might say, well, you need to pay for that, right? There's a little more serious of a consequence than just kicking the fan over, especially if it broke, right? Still doing the same motion. What if I took your dog now and put it right there? I wouldn't say a cat because I think most of you would agree with me that's not a problem. But (laughs) but what what if I took your dog and just put it right there? Right? That might be a little more serious of a problem. You may have a, an issue with that. What if I took your baby? That becomes an even more serious consequence, right? That be, becomes, you could go to prison for that. You would probably beat me up for that. I'm still the same motion. I mean, what's so wrong? I'm doing the same motion as when I kicked the fan, right? Now I'm just kicking a baby. What if I kicked a king or a ruler or the president? Just like this. I'm going to, I'm going to prison, probably, right? It's the same motion. You guys see that? It's the same motion. I'm still doing the same act. The, the offense happens based on who the offense is done against. It becomes to become greater and greater and greater. And so when God says sin is wrong because it's an offense against me, we're talking about someone greater than any king or president or baby or dog or cat, if you're into that. We're talking about the God of the universe. So it doesn't matter what the act is, whether it's rape, murder, or gossiping, or envying, The ultimate offense and atrocity of that sin is against the one whom that sin is committed. That's God. Same motion, whether it's a fan or a baby, right? There's completely different consequences. And that's what makes sin so atrocious that you and I, essentially, when we sin, we spit in God's face. This is what Adam and Eve were doing with the fruit. We spit in God's face and say, you don't know what you're talking about. I am my own master. I get to define my own truth. 
whatever sin we're talking about. And this is why sin is so horrible. And then look what it does. Look how it kind of spirals off from here, begins to, to start the blame game, right? Verse 12, we'll read that again. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. All right, look how, what Adam does. This woman he gave to me, she did it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, that serpent deceived me and I ate. And that spirals down. And then Satan just says, hey, I'm, I'm Satan. So he doesn't blame anybody. He just knows he's in the wrong, right? That blame game, that's, that's how sin, that's what happens. Right? We, we never want to take our, uh, our, uh, we never want to be responsible for that. We never want to take responsibility. We want to say, look at these other things. Look at everything going on around me. Look what you've done, God. Look who you gave me, right? Sin spirals down into this blame game. And then we continue on. Now Satan gets cursed by God. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Another, another question some of you may have and many people have is, why did God not immediately destroy Satan here? One, we have to say, I think on one hand we have to say, the same three words we said last week. You guys remember those three words? I don't know, right? It's okay to say that. We're not God. God has not given us that knowledge. I, I don't know why God allowed Satan to continue on. But I do know this. These are the things we do know. The words of Colossians 1.16 says, For by him, talking about Jesus here, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, which includes invisible rulers and authorities, Satan and demons, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. Who does all things leave out? Does that leave Satan out? No. So even Satan was created through Jesus and for Jesus. Can you imagine? I have no idea how that works. But that's how sovereign and great the God is that we serve. Jesus created even Satan and his demons to serve his purposes. All things were created through him and for him. So I don't know why God didn't just destroy Satan immediately right there, but I do know that one day he will. I do know that one day he will work it for his glory, and we will see that. We may never see that here on this earth. One day we will see how wonderful and glorious God's plan was. When we look back over our lives, I love the way John Piper says it. He says, God's doing about 10,000 things in your life right now, and you're aware of three of them. God's constantly working when you and I cannot see, and so we trust him. And now the Satan, the serpent is, is cursed, and this is more than just, did, well, did snakes used to have legs, and now they have to crawl? That's not necessarily the point. God's making a point about Satan. Like, he is going to be the lowest of the low. Dust will be his food all of his days. This is his lot. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Right? Satan and mankind are going to be at odds. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If, if, I have, if you have your Bible, I would circle he and his in that last sentence. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we're going to come back to that in, the moment, in a moment because this is kind of the crux of this text. We'll see that here in a minute. Let's, get, let's continue on, though. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So now we begin to see how uh, the, the relationships between mankind, between man and woman, begin to break down here. You see that, right? Like when, when the relationship with God breaks down, all the rest of the relationships break down. This is why, Christian, you and I have to have a right view of, of, of God and the, that everything begins with him. So when someone comes you to, with you to, a, uh, to you with a marriage problem, you don't just say, well, here's 10 steps to fix your marriage. You go to the heart of it and say, like, let's go to God, to the gospel, because he's the one who designed marriage. And, and if you don't get that right, you won't get anything else right. Again, you could live in Mayberry and have the perfect life and the perfect marriage and, and the perfect kids and still go to hell and not really know what life is all about. It all goes back to God, and this is why we have to bring it back to him. Our relationship with God is important, and when that breaks down, all the other 
relationships begin to break down. The enmity between people is because of the curse of sin. And this is especially true, as we'll see here in a moment, but in the realms of family and work. That's where these two things, I think, are hit hardest. Verse 16, again, let's read that. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So the first consequence we see of the sin is that women will have pain in childbearing. All right? and, and I've seen that firsthand. Many of you husbands have seen that, and women have experienced it, right? And, uh, no, never mind, I was going to make a joke. Uh, but no joke there. But that's, that's the pain of, of childbearing. That's what childbearing, uh, that's what sin has now done. It's, been, it's made childbearing painful, not just in the birth process itself, but actually in the raising of the child. That's really the, the, what it's talking about here when he says, in pain you shall bring forth children. In other, in other words, that pain, physical and emotional, will continue on as you raise up that children. I know, ladies, you love your kids, but it is often painful to raise them, right? Because you're raising little sinners, being raised by you, a little sinner, right? And that's, that's hard to do. There's a lot of emotional and physical pain in that. And this is how sin breaks that relationship, breaks that relationship with, ch- with children, and then it breaks that relationship with husbands. Go look at the second part of verse 16 again. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Some of your translations may, see, may say your desire will be for your husband. But, but what it's talking about there is it's actually talking about it's going to be for your husband's position or contrary to your husband. It's the same word that's used in the next chapter, in chapter 4, verse 7, when we get to this, the story of Cain and Abel. And it says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? God's telling this to Cain. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That's the same Hebrew word as we see here. So when your translation says, uh, your desire shall be for your husband. It's actually talking, your desire will be for your husband's position, right? that leadership role. Your, your desire will be contrary. I think the ESV gets it right when it says that. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Right? We, we talked a little bit a couple weeks ago about the family dynamic, how men are supposed to take this loving, caring leadership role and lovingly lay down their their lives for their wives, like Christ lays down his life for the church. And, and women are meant to willingly, lovingly submit to their husband's leadership. And, and now sin has fractured that relationship. Right? Sin, sin makes those things wrong. The relationship between husband and wife is meant to be perfectly wonderful. But now wives often despise the husband's leadership. And the husband often abuses his place by mistreating his wife. We see that time. I mean, how many times have we seen the Bible, specifically by husbands, used to cut their wives? The Bible is a sword, but it was never meant to cut one another. Christian, we have to get that. It's meant to cut us, penetrate our own hearts, and then defend us against the attacks of Satan. When we begin to use it to cut one another, we have a false view of it. This is what sin has done. It breaks down this relationship. Verse 17, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now work becomes laborious, no longer fulfilling and satisfying. And death is ushered in, right? He says that for, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So now work is no longer fulfilling for men. It becomes laborious. It often takes us away from families and from what's important. Work is still a good thing, just like family is still a good thing, but sin has fractured both of those realms. This is what sin begins to do, and now ushers in death. This should break our hearts, right? This is what sin has done. This is how sick and gross sin is. And yet we see that there's grace within this brokenness. There's grace even within the consequences of sin here. Because look what God does. God confronts Adam and Eve in their sin, not just because of his wrath, but because of their love. It would actually be unloving for God to just say, I'm not going to 
to uh, face you or confront you in your sin. I'm just going to leave you to your own devices. That would be like a doctor who knew a patient has cancer and yet says, you're fine. That doctor has to confront that patient in his cancer and say, you have cancer, and so now we have to figure out how to treat this. This is what God is doing here. He's confronting them, and he's saying, you are broken, and nothing else is going to satisfy you. It's actually grace that God says, family's no longer going to satisfy you. Work is no longer going to satisfy you. Men, you cannot find your ultimate identity in your job. Women, you cannot find your ultimate identity in your children or your husband. We cannot find our ultimate identity in anything because it's broken, it's fractured, and that's actually great grace because all of those things from the beginning were always meant to point us to the one relationship which was meant to fulfill us. That's our relationship with God. So when we see brokenness in our marriage, brokenness in our families, brokenness in our workplace, brokenness throughout the world, we have to look to the grace of Jesus and say, this is always meant to to point me to you so that I would be fulfilled in you and you alone. I love how Augustine says this in his book, Confessions on His Conversion. He says, your goad, right, this uncomfortableness that God was, was thrusting at him. He says, your goad was thrusting at my heart, giving me no peace until the eye of my soul could discern you without mistake. In other words, how uncomfortable his sin was. And Augustine lived in great sin, if you know anything about his story. How uncomfortable that was, was actually, he saw that as grace. God prodding him and saying, no, look to me. I'm the only thing that's going to satisfy you. And God doesn't leave us in this brokenness. It's actually great grace. Go back to verse 15. I said we would look at that again. Verse 15 in Genesis 3. This is kind of the crux of this text. God says, I will put enmity or division, strife, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the one thing that will fulfill us. Offspring there, notice how it says he, right? That's pretty interesting how it shifts. It says between your offspring and her offspring. Then it it zeroes in on one offspring, he. And anytime we see that in Scripture, I, I hope you see this, Christian, read the Old Testament through this lens. Anytime we see offspring or seed or even Israel, it's not talking just about a nation or a group of people, but rather one person, Jesus. So when we see the the New Testament begin to redefine what the Old Testament is, that offspring, that seed, the greater Israel is actually Jesus. Jesus is that better offspring. Jesus is that better seed. Jesus is the better Israel. It's always singular, pointing to Christ. That's why it says, He, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise His heel. That is talking about Christ. This is called the, the proto In other words, the first gospel. Right? The first time we see Right after the brokenness happens in Genesis 3, now we see the gospel proclaimed. The whole Bible is pointing us to the gospel. The whole Bible is pointing us to the grace of Christ. That didn't start in what we call the gospels. It's all pointing us to him. It says, he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Satan will leave a mark, but Jesus will crush his head. I think Matthew's got a, um, an image that I wanted to show you here. And I think this image just really captures for us beautifully what this verse is talking about. You see the serpent there biting Jesus' heel at the cross, and yet he's pierced through his head. His head is crushed. That's the victory that Christ has won for us. Yeah, Christ had his heel bruised, per se, right? He died, but he rose again. He's still alive, and his, his is the victory. Satan's head is crushed. He is defeated. And one day he will ultimately be destroyed. And I think that picture captures it so well for us. I love this this little book, the Jesus Storybook Bible. By the way, we have several of these back in our resource shelf uh, back there. Feel free to pick it up. And I I think if you're you're having, even if you don't have young kids in your home, if you're having a hard time seeing how all the Bible fits together, I would highly recommend getting this book and see how it's all about Jesus from beginning to end. Let me just read a little short passage from here, from the fall, and and this promise from Genesis 3.15. It says, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him and run from him, deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him 
Lost children yearning for their home. Do you ever feel like that? Lost, this place isn't our home. But before they left the garden, God whispered a promise to Adam and Eve. It will not always be so. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I'm not, I'm going to do, when I do, I'm going to do battle against the snake. I'll get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness you let in here. I'm coming back for you. And he would. One day, God himself would come. And he did 2,000 years ago. And he died on a cross in our place. And now our enemy is defeated. Satan's head has been crushed. And one day he will be locked up in hell forever. And, and you may say, well, why? Evil's still growing, right? We, scripture tells us that evil would grow. We see evil and wickedness everywhere. Well, yes, a wounded animal often inflicts more damage than a healthy one. Right? Have you ever wounded an animal and it inflicts great damage? I've used this illustration before, but I remember a few years back, my brother and I were quail hunting in New Mexico and in rattlesnake territory, right? I'm thankful there's no rattlesnakes here. And, and we were hunting, and we came up on the side of this hill. There was a, a snake coiled up, and we could hear its rattle going. And right there from me to that pillar was a six-and-a-half-foot rattlesnake, huge, massive rattlesnake. And so I turned to it. My brother and I shot. Its head is completely blown off, and it's still striking. If you've never seen that, it's kind of amazing, right? It still struck at me, and I had to kind of jump back. It was crushed. Its head was gone, and yet it still gives that last-minute push, right? That last minute trying to, to get back at it. This is what Satan is doing. Satan's head is crushed. He's like that serpent with no head, and he's writhing around trying to cause and inflict pain like only he can. And so we see evil around, but his doom is sure. He is defeated. He is defanged. We'll see that more a little bit next week. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Christ has defeated Satan in your place, Christian. That's what he did on the cross so that you could be made right with God. And that's what we have to remind ourselves constantly, the gospel. Look to Jesus. And we all come to this Adam-like moment. I call it this Adam-like moment where we, we will one day stand before God and have to give an account for what we did. And I think John Chapter 3, go with me there, and this is where, we'll, where we will end today. John chapter 3 gives us the great hope of what we look to, of who we look to. When we come to this Adam-like moment, having to answer for our sin in the presence of God, and this is why, Christian, you and I do not have to be fearful John 3, starting in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I wish we could go to that text. We don't have time, but go read Numbers 21. By the way, serpent, the serpent theme is throughout Scripture. Numbers 21, the people of Israel were complaining to God again, and so God sends them these fiery serpents. That would be crazy to see. right? And they begin biting uh, the people of Israel, and they die. And so God tells Moses, hey, make a bronze serpent. And hold it up. And whoever looks at that will be saved. So they would look at the serpent. right? You see the, the parallelism. You see the picture that God is already using in that. And now he's saying, Jesus is saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That was him on the cross. He was lifted up on this tree that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. What do we do when we come to that Adam-like moment? Do we begin to blame others? God, look at these people around me. He created me in an evil world. Or do we defend ourselves in our pseudo-righteousness? like the Pharisees did. Look, look how good I am. Look at, look at what I've done. Or do we say, no, I have no hope. I'm broken and sinful, but I'm going to look to Jesus who died in my place, who crushed the head of the serpent in my place, who defeated Satan and sin and death in my place, and I'm going to place all my trust in him. And that's a daily thing, Christian. We're not just talking about one time when you were eight years old writing your name on a VBS card. This is a daily practice. Are you... Today, trusting in Jesus, saying he has defeated my sin. 
trusting him. I'm following after him. And, and are you trusting his grace to lead you? That will affect everything else we do in life. And that's what we're here doing over and over and over again, reminding ourselves of the gospel, reminding ourselves of Jesus. You and I need the gospel. Paul says it's for our past, our present, and our future in 1 Corinthians 15. We have to remind ourselves of the gospel constantly. Look to Jesus. He crushed the enemy for us. Christian, don't fret. While we pray and we fight against wickedness in this world, we don't fret, we don't fear. We trust that Jesus has won the victory and our enemy is a crushed serpent writhing around in his last few moments. One day the pain and brokenness will be no more. Trust the great serpent crusher. Let's pray together. Jesus, continue to help us have a right vision of who you are of the victory that you have won. Make us trust in you more, Lord. Thank you that you crushed the head of the serpent in our place, that you defeated sin and death, and we can look at the cross and say, Jesus died in my place. Help us to trust you more. Lord, I pray for those who are believers who have trusted you, that they would continually remind themselves of the gospel, continually remind themselves of the grace that you have given. They would walk by grace. They would walk trusting in you. And Jesus, I pray if there's anyone in here or online who has never placed their faith in you, has never trusted you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior, that they would do so. They would look to the great serpent crusher here of Genesis 3.15. Acknowledging their sin and brokenness and acknowledging that they can do nothing to make themselves right with God. Jesus, you're the only one who can. Help us to trust you and treasure you and love you more. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And one of the, the things we try to do here, specifically as elders or pastors, myself, Rob, Ted, and David, uh, we want to help you. Our job is not just to help believers live well, but to help people die well. Right? And this is what we're talking about here, ultimate destiny. And so we want to help you uh, along with trusting the great serpent crusher, right? with trusting the gospel. So please come talk to us. Come talk to one of us. Uh, you can, I'm here in the office most days during the week. You can email me at uh, pastor at machiasvalley.org. Um, we want to have that conversation. And maybe if God's pulling in your heart and you really have never, you may have been coming here for a long time and have never trusted in him, Come talk to one of us. We want to point you to, to Jesus. Right? He's calling. He loves you. And he has made a way so that we can be made right with him as he crushed the head of the serpent, as he crushed sin and death on the cross for us and then sealed it as he rose from the grave. Keep trusting that. Keep trusting him. And make much of him this week. Remember, you're a sent person called to go out to this world and make disciples. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you again that you crushed Satan, sin, and death for us. And even though wickedness and evil is all around us, we know that like an injured, injured animal writhing around, causing and inflicting damage, one day Satan's doom is sure, and he will be locked away forever. Lord, I pray every single person here would have a right view of who you are and whose they are. They would trust you and follow after you all of their days. God, convict our hearts like only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll see you soon.